Chapter 6 Bogfly and Rutherford Telling Lilius and Thalius that she would no longer be in their employ was one of the most difficult conversations that Ruala ever had to have. It was much harder than she had initially anticipated, and they plied her with extraordinary offers of wage raises and benefits, so that eventually she had to explain that she had an ailment that had to be seen to, and that she must depart or her health would suffer. She did not specify by how much it would mean where she was going exactly, what the condition entailed, or with whom she would be traveling, but she guessed that Lilith would speculate long and hard enough to at least hazard an accurate guess whom she had chosen as traveling companions. Both the Lilius and Thalius gave her remarkably kind farewell, <clears throat> kind farewell gifts. Lilius provided food, practical clothes that were certainly meant for a young man, an extra blanket, and a few basic supplies that Ruala would never have thought to carry. Just in case, they both told her about the lovely antique blade that Thalius tucked into the pocket of her bag. She stopped to say goodbye to her parents, hoping for some reversal of their coldness now that she was leaving altogether, that all that she got was a grunt from her father and a raised eyebrow to from her mother, who sat on a rocking chair, knitting and frowning. It was almost too infuriating to tolerate, so she left and went back to the pony to meet up with Galen. She had other acquaintances in the town, certainly, but no one she felt attached enough to to say goodbye to. She was becoming more nervous and excited as the morning progressed, and she went to knock on Galen's door to see if, perhaps, he had managed to procure some form of transportation for at least a portion of their journey. He didn't answer, so she went up to her room to finish packing her few possessions. She tried on the traveling costume that Thalius and Lilius had given to her, and was quite pleased with the results. The thick earthen brown pants tied off at the knee and complemented the tall black boots that Lilith had given to her. There was an off-white peasant shirt and a delightful fitted leather coat. She wound her hair, her, her hair up and inserted the hair sticks into her bun rather than packing them. Out of sheer curiosity, she pulled a dagger from the pocket of her pack and strapped it to her hips. Examining her transformation in the mirror was astonishing. She looked like a warrior. She laughed furiously and clapped like a little child, realizing that this was far more exciting than any vacation, even if her life was to be at risk. It dawned on her that the clothes were not a man's at all, but clearly made for the form of a woman. Almost exactly her height and build. Ruella dashed out of her room and came thumping down the stairs. Running up to Lilius, she threw her arms around the portly, stunned woman mid-scream, chastising the cooking staff for wasting supplies and gave her a quick peck on the cheek. These are perfect, Ruala exclaimed. I don't think I would have ever found anything that would serve me in this well. Elias reddened at the dramatic show of affection and said, I doubt it as well. Those belonged to me when I was your age. Thalias and I lived in the northeast and it wasn't unusual for girls there to be far more practical than pretty. 
But then my idiot husband had to infuriate the local guardsman, and we had to flee. Now, if you'll excuse me, Ruella, I must attend to my wayward staff. She turned about and began castigating an unwary cook. What the bloody hell do you think you are doing with that fowl? Planning on poisoning the customers? She stomped after the target of her rage and left the still giddy Ruella to digest the newly acquired information about Lilius. It seemed appropriate somehow, since she knew that the mountains were home to barbarians, warriors, and a very dark magic. Lilius was the closest thing to a barbarian that Ruala could imagine. What Ruala knew about the mountains was perhaps too strong a word. Overheard by drunkards recounting their supposed adventures would have been a more accurate description. Galen walked in the front door with a look of extreme irritation and made his way in the direction of the staircase. It occurred to Ruala that he didn't even recognize her, so she pounced on him as he began to climb the staircase, giving him a gentle shove. As he turned to angrily retaliate against the rude gesture, his eyes brightened and he laughed with a sudden delight at the change. Excellent. You're, you're dressed as a northern girl. Sheer perfection. I doubt I could have thought of a safer costume for you. You look exceptional. Now, if you would be so kind, walk with me. She did so, and listened to Galen recount with dismay his inability to find a suitable mount for mounts. Everyone appeared to have great need of their own, and those who would have been willing to sell their horses or pack beasts had already done so to stranded festival attendees. He had found a means of transport, but he doubted it would be particularly stylish. However, he had, hesitantly, reserved a seat on the wagon belonging to Bogfly the Troll. Ruella was excited enough about the journey and her emerging magical powers that she didn't care at all what sort of creatures they traveled with, and said so. This relieved Galen a great deal. He had not traveled with a woman before, but had imagined that they had tended to be overly demanding and extremely fragile, though he was getting the impression that this voyage would not be nearly as trying as he had initially anticipated. They gathered their belongings and made for the wagon, several sentimental drunks standing with Lilius and Thalius as they waved goodbye from the steps of the black pony. The pair of them made off through the muddy streets in the direction that Galen had indicated Bogfly and his cart to be in, picking their way through the crowds on this, the last day of the Harvest Festival. When they reached the wagon, Ruala recognized the very troll who had sold her the peculiar Golden Empress to be the creature towards which they appeared to be headed. He, Ruala asked Galen, he is the one that sold me the trinket I showed you. If I recall correctly, he has an allergy to man-dander. I cannot fathom why someone with that condition would choose to transport humans, let alone participate in a massive celebration hosted by them. Galen hoisted his bag into, his, into the caravan that sat behind Bogfly's table. Prophet, he suggested climbing into the wagon, <clears throat> and began to take the other bag from Ruella. I doubt that he can stand it much longer, though. If you'll notice, he's leaving well before the rest of the merchants, and appears to have lost his zest for acquisition. Ruella looked over and observed that Bogfly was indeed packing his wares into crates, sneezing angrily and ignoring the people who might purchase his remaining goods. Well, I can't blame him. He appears to be miserable, she said, and climbed into the wagon. Bogfly walked over to them, encumbered with several wooden cases. Diminutive as he was, he seemed overburdened by his load. 
Luella jumped down and began to motion that she would be happy to help, her long-instilled waitressing instincts asserting themselves. No, no, get away from me, you wretched girl. What kind of fool do you think I am? You'll make off with all my wares before I can blink. He backed away defensively and pulled the crates from Morales' range. They wobbled precariously, but did not fall. Get in. Will, leaving right away, I can't tolerate any more of this filth and noise. He waddled up to the wooden steps leading to them to the back of the wagon and dropped the crates onto the floor with a thud. This place is dreadful. I can see why you want to leave. He moved between them and walked around towards the horses that he had tethered to the front of his mobile emporium. I will be glad to be gone. Sit down and don't bother me, belly aching or tails, as I am not concerned. With your nonsense. He climbed up to the driver's seat as Galen and Ruella quick, quietly smirked and settled themselves in for the journey. As they rolled further and further towards the edge of Jonagan, the crowds thinned and the buildings became sparser and more practical in construction. Eventually, they passed further than she had ever been, and her heart beat faster as she realized they were passing landmarks she had never seen. It was all so unfamiliar, and she began to feel somewhat ill at ease. However, as time passed, in the quiet, thinly wooded forest turned to plains, she became comfortable with the new surroundings, and her head rolled to the side. Her heavy eyelids drooped, and she dro dozed off into a dreamless sleep. When she woke some time later, the afternoon had crept over the horizon, and the orange light that diffused through the clouds seemed to especially subdued. She felt intensely comforted by the gentle jostling and thumping of the dangerously ancient wagon wheels beneath her. Ruella looked up and saw, not too far distant, the ruins of a keep and the banks of a river. Turning her face to Galen's, she stretched and smiled. How long was I asleep? He handed her some smoked fish and cold dark bread. Perhaps two hours. I am not surprised, as I doubt very much you've been sleeping well these past few nights. You know, you spoke while unconscious. Just now, I mean, before you woke up. You said something about the chickens. He laughed. And you said my name as well, though I'm not sure if it was within the same context. I do hope not. Ruella rubbed the sleep from her eyes. I do not think so, though I can't remember. So it is impossible to be certain. She smirked wickedly at him and chuckled. Quit your yapping. Bogfly barked from the front of the dray. We approached an associate of mine, and I need you both to be as discreet as possible. You must close the back doors of the wagon and not speak, if you care for your lives at all. Since I do not, it is all the same to me except that it might disrupt my transaction. So keep quiet. Galen shrugged and drew, closed the doors, but moved to a crack in the side of the trailer so as to be able to review the situation. Ruella scooted close to Galen, and they both peered out the tiny hole at their destination. Neither of them saw any houses or buildings of any kind, and instead... They seemed to be drawn near to a low cliff face. Bogfly pulled on the reins, and the horses slowed and stopped. He hopped down from the seat and approached a large opening that was disguised by rocks and debris. He held in his plump, warty fingers a medium-sized wooden box and call, called out in his distinct nasal troll voice, Rutherford? Rutherford, get out here. He scratched his head, and the funny pointed hat rocked from side to side. A thatch of curly white stringy troll hair popped out. He mumbled grumpily and scruffed the ground with his pointed shoes. Curse it all, you oaf. I don't have all day. 
Do you want it or not? He cried and stomped his small foot on the ground. There was a loud rumbling and the ground shook ominously. Bogfly, is that you? The rubble blocking the cave suddenly crumbled, and both Galen and Ruella's eyes widened as the very ogre who had been evicted from the harvest festival climbed out from the cave and stretched his limbs and back out, revealing how massive he was, far taller than the cave itself. Ruella covered her mouth to prevent an involuntary shriek. Galen managed to maintain his composure and narrowed his eyes at the gargantuan beast that approached the small troll. I can't recall why I've asked for you, Bogfly. What is it you have brought me today? Bogfly kicked the foot of the ogre in a disdainful gesture that demonstrated a complete lack of fear, even though the perplexed Rutherford could have crushed Bogfly in an instant. You ninny. Rutherford, I have brought you memory serum you asked for. I bring these to you every six months. You must. You are such a useless creature. I don't know why I continue to assist you. Now listen closely. I have two humans. He sneered hatefully. And they purchased transport with me. I have them in the back of the wagon but I have shut the doors as to not startle you. They will be coming with me, and I know that, as you always do, you will follow me. It is my duty to be an honest businessman to instruct you, but under no circumstances are you to eat either of them, no matter the temptation you may feel. Now drink the concoction so you won't forget my instructions. The ogre took the vial from Bogfly and shrugged, and consumed the contents of the small bottle comically miniature in his huge hand. His posture was that of an ape, his only clothing a pair of shredded trousers. He carried with him a wooden club, studded with metal spikes, which dragged on the ground as he lumbered out into the open. Humans, you may come out of here. Uh, you need not hide. I will not devour you. I will keep my word on that no matter how young and tender you are. Tentatively, Galen opened the back of the cart and stepped out. He was dwarfed by Rutherford, who even when hunched was half again as tall as the man. Here I am, Moger. I understand that you are under oath not to eat either myself or my companion. I have never traveled with one of your kind but as long as you hold your word, you shall have no problem. We shall have no problem with your presence. As a matter of fact, I hold your race in high regard, as I know that you are both brave and honorable warriors when put to the test. Let me inquire, though. How is it that you remember this particular troll? The great monster regarded the tiny human with melancholy lowering of his eyelids. To be truthful, I'm not certain. I have no memory of my family. I believe they were killed, but I do not recall this. I do not recall that. This troll made it his business to feed and shelter me, though he had no obligation to do so. Bogfly, why is there something that I do not remember? Will you speak for me? Bogfly sneezed and glowered at Galen. Yes, yes. I cared for this brute when he was a baby after I found him half starved, gnawing on the rotting carcass of a giant swamp rat. I was hoping that I could perhaps use him as a pack animal and sell him as a curiosity, but as he grew, it became impossible. Eventually, after I tried to abandon him, he began to follow my wagon. That was fifteen years ago, and since then he has followed me like a dog wherever I go, preventing both my return to my own people and putting a damper on any hopes I may have for anything but a purely nomadic existence. Though I always had grand dreams to start a small farm, not that it's any of your concern. Ruala at this point decided to descend from the back of the wagon and approach Hello, Rutherford. My name is Arala. 
It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. She curtsied and held out her palm, which the ogre accepted. Her entire outstretched hand lay on his forefinger, and he leaned over and sniffed her hair. As he drew near, she could clearly see his rough, greenish skin and wart-covered nose. His eyes seemed uneven, one being clearly higher than the other, and his teeth were huge and jagged. Several were obviously broken, and there was a clear scent of blood on his teeth. He grinned and blinked at Vuela. Do not concern yourself, young creature. You need not fear me. I am under an oath, which I intend to keep, at least for the next six months, until I forget again. Bogfly moaned. Ah, perhaps he will forget you, but never poor Bogfly. I tried leaving him without the memory tonic, and he persisted in following me anyhow, for three whole years. He was even more of a nuisance without it, which is why I still bring it to him. Bogfly turned back to the wagon. <sighs> At least he makes a good bodyguard, he grumbled and climbed back into the driver's seat. The horses seemed both unperturbed and acclimated to the enormous presence of Rutherford. Galen looked at Ruella, impressed by her composure, and walked back with her to the wagon. I suppose we shall have an escort of sorts then, he said, and climbed back into the compartment. He grabbed her arm and assisted her back inside. I suppose so, she replied skeptically. They both sat quietly as the mismatched convoy started out. First the wagon, then far behind barely audible, the low, steady drumming of Rutherford's footsteps tramping behind them. <laughs>